there is this constant back and forth going on about we don't want to work more than four days a week. We don't want to work more than this many hours. And it's fine. But I would like to understand for someone very ambitious, for someone who wants to like move fast in the like the first 10 years of their career, because that's pretty much everybody's plans, right? You know that the first 10 years are the most crucial or at least, you know, that's a general idea people have. What advice would you give to them? What is the healthiest approach they should have as they venture into the workplace? And the other thing, the, the sort of mindset they should have. So I love this so much, Krati, and thank you so much for having me back. I think this is such a relevant question that, in fact, I just covered on something that I was doing with a New Zealand Australia company just before this recording. And so, you know, when it comes to this dichotomy between let's work a lot let's work so hard because we're ambitious and we need to achieve a lot and now nah, you know just stay at home and don't do much or just do less power down kind of similar to when the pandemic started and someone said let's not waste the time let's not waste lockdown and some other therapists started saying you know what like lockdown was incredibly triggering how do we navigate that balance so first you know decide on what what are your values you know like are you do you really really like to accomplish stuff and why are you doing that for and is that really you or is this somebody else's values that you are inheriting that's one because some people really love to work and and then some people they work a lot because they're expected to in a certain culture or it's a great way of keeping themselves distracted okay and then you know when you're able to answer that then you know remember that while there are many different views out there, including mine, ask yourself what suits you the most, okay? So in this case, you know, like, so I'll give you a very general idea here. When you are young, you run, your upper limit that you run into is your experience. So you can afford to give in more time, okay? But looking busy isn't the same as being accomplished. Yeah. There is a very, very fast difference. Okay. And many people glorify busy, especially in certain cultures where it's just about overwork and cultures that have no idea that they're anxious or stressed or think that it's so normal and actually make jokes about it. Um, so be aware of what that looks like and then be and also aware even more that it's not the number of hours you work, but how you work those hours. If you can be clear about your values and the way you're going to optimize your brain, then it's incredibly different in terms of your outcome. So I'll give you an example, you know, when it comes to what it means to optimize your brain. Yeah, you know, sure, you could do the same things everybody else does, you know, um, like, like, you know, fumble from one spot to another spot. Sometimes, you know, like come late to your appointments or forget your appointments or... Or, or just generally have a bit of a mess because everybody kind of tolerates, everybody's going to cope with that anyway. Or you can ask yourself, how can I live differently? How can I live better in a way that I actually have a lot more mental clarity and my everyday life is a, is a place from which I have space to make wiser decisions, okay? So it's like if you have your phone and just go to have default settings, you're going to have a thousand notifications and it's going to exhaust all of you. That's default settings. Your default settings in your brain and the way we are programmed to work or play or just interact with people do not work well for us. So ask yourself then, you know, if you're really keen on working hard, then what does that mean? So what can we do differently to optimize the way your brain works instead of glorifying working across every single time zone and being really, really exhausted? Yeah, you could work across time zones and you could be not exhausted. You could actually be energized. So do you see the difference and the nuances in what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. I, I love what you're saying. Talk to me a little bit more about this, because I think this will also, this sort of caters to the, the ones who want to work really freaking hard. And they can do that without burning out with the method that you're suggesting. And also the people who don't want to work so hard, they can get more out of the time they do put in. So I think I love this. Tell me where we can start with this. So where we can start in that is to understand that every day we wake up with a finite amount of energy. And if you don't honor the fact that it's finite, you're going to exhaust the hell out of yourself. Okay. So the first thing I always do every day is I check my battery. What's my own battery levels? You know, like sometimes when we wake up and we unplug our phone, we realize that, ha, the phone didn't charge. Okay. We can be like that 
on most dates, actually. And sometimes our batteries are depleted a lot faster. So ask yourself today, what's my battery level? Or remember, right, like even if your battery is 30% because life happens, um, it's not, not a sense of shame. Admitting it to ourselves actually gives us our power back because in, because even if we don't admit it to ourselves, it's kind of just floating very nebulously at the back of our head, right? And that steals even more energy. So step one is if you're not well, if you're tired, if you're exhausted, Admit that to yourself. Check in with your battery levels. Step two, there's a difference between your mental and physical energy. Okay. So, you know, for instance, you know, there are times when, you know, in the past few years, when I found myself able to bike in the gym, 12K, right? But if you ask me to sit down and write, say, a little strategy document for my business, nope. Okay. Does that mean I'm lazy? Not quite. Because what that means is that mental energy is very different from your physical energy. Mental energy involves your mood, your motivation, your cognitive processes at a time. And if you have things stealing your mental energy, for instance, if it's been a tough day, then it will take your mental energy away. If you are ill, it will take your mental energy away. And at a point in the last few years, what happened was my mother was mismedicated quite a few years ago. I mean, four years ago. Um, and we lost her. So I spent a lot of time looking out for her, making sure that things were okay. So while I was not living there, I was always, a lot of mental energy was being chewed up that way. And that was a choice that I also made, not to waste my mental energy, but to look out for her. So because of that, I knew that I had to power down in some parts of my life. Okay. So being aware of what's taking your mental energy in the background and whether you are willing for that to happen is a big deal. So other ways in which you know, we have to think about what choose our mental energy would be, for instance, there's things in our lives that we've got to maintain. So I always say that the cost of something is not the cost that you pay at that moment. Okay, so let's say you say, you think, oh, you know, I have to check in with, let's say you've got a really annoying partner that you don't like. Okay, I hope not. But the thing is that, you know, there are more relationships right. in the world than not. Yeah. Okay, so let's say you've got a partner you really dislike, right? And you're supposed to check in with this person five minutes every two hours because they are a bit intrusive to say the least so the five minutes that you pay is not five minutes it's actually the time before and after okay if you decide to scoff down one entire cake the price you pay is not just how much you're paying for the cake the price you pay is what happens to your brain energy after and what's going to happen to your body and whether the next day you decide that you know what screw it i want to eat more cake because i really hate this and i really hate myself Right. So be very open about like what is in the background that's taking your energy away and being able to admit that to yourself, which is why, you know, for instance, like I always say, if you are not feeling well, admit that to yourself. If you're going through a more difficult phase in life, you know, or in your, in, in the, like the work year. So for instance, for some industries, you know, it's like March, April, May. So some is the end of the year, then be very aware of how you're going to budget your energy. Okay, if there are things in your life that you know are going to take more energy, for instance, like in my life, June and July are full of birthdays. <laughs> That's going to take energy away, right? That's also going to take, my, go to, I'm going to have to spend money as well. So that's also something that you got to think about. Or, you know, maybe like G December, January, February is also a very heavy social time when it comes to the holidays, Chinese New Year, yeah. Christmas, end of the year levels. So being aware of that will help you budget and mental energy better. And also when it think about what I call financial sanity as well. So, you know, like, you know, you might think to yourself that you're, you know, spending like $20, $20 a month, maintain, like on this subscription, it's no big deal. Technically, it's no big deal. But if you are not using it and you're resenting the $20, then actually it takes your mental energy away. So, you know, like, so all I'm asking you is basically sit down and ask yourself, what are the three main things that you maybe live with that, you know, that is not... Maybe it's a choice, okay? Like, for instance, when I was deciding that I have to look out for my mom and, you know, just make sure that she's there. I, I'm there for her and, you know, watch her progress. That's big, right? That's something I chose, okay? It's also thinking about, you know, the things that you have to live with. So, for instance, some people live with, you know, like like constraints on their health, their physical health. 
right? Let's say, again, let's say chronic fatigue, people with immunity issues, or people who are just very, very tired because they have, um, they, they have their cat, their, their caretakers. Okay. Then we also think about the kind of things that we are maintaining and paying the costs for that we resent. Okay. Maybe it's a relationship. You know, an ambivalent friendship that seems like a frenemy. You know, there's some positive and some negative, and you think, ah, you know, like this is not so bad, but actually it is bad. <laughs> okay, so think about along the lines, and then one, you know, admit to yourself what is within your control and what and and what's real, what's your reality, and and decide what can you color of your life. That seems like a hard thing to do, but I think it would be a game changer. I think it would also. Oh, yeah, it would also bring focus to the fact that so many of us associate, uh, you know, we derive self-worth from how many hours we work. Like, especially in India, we, anybody who's like working 12 hours a day, they feel so proud of themselves that, yes, I'm doing it right. When in fact, like I've noticed that in the in the offices here, when I was working a nine to five and the New York office would call and they would just leave parties and they would wake up in the middle of the night to take those calls, which was so bizarre to me. Why is nobody from the Indian office telling the American office that, hello, you're calling us at these bizarre hours when we're supposed to be sleeping? Please be more accommodative of the time zone difference. Nobody would say that. Now, what you've done is you've jeopardized your sleep the sleep quality, your sleep health is not great now, which will also impact you the next morning, which means you're not going to be as productive, which means you're probably going to stay longer in the office to get the same amount of work done. It's so, yep. I think what you've said, I think that is that is where it's a good place to start because I think very often when people talk about burnout, I'm sure there are a lot of physiological factors and we can talk about that, but um, I think a lot of it is just bad time management, bad resource management, like you said. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a boundary issue. You know, like so, boundaries are the ability to say no. So it comes down to two things. One is, do you have? Do you feel you have permission to say so? And if you don't, no matter what you say, no one's going to believe you, right? And you're going to attract people who would love to 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 step over your boundaries. And two, do you have the words? So find the scripts, write the scripts, write them out, rehearse them in your head. It's going to be awkward. Any skill you start with is going to be awkward full stop right so have the idea in mind and be able to set your boundaries and remember that boundaries are not pugnacious you don't have to be ugly and awful you can say it in a very graceful manner during a pandemic over here what happened was for the first time hybrid work a uh, uh, remote work took off because we still have a very strong culture of micromanaging so you no know, like and that then falls down to the idea about how many is about overwork so working a lot of hours to demonstrate that or there doesn't nobody cares how efficient you are <laughs> actually in that sense um it's, it's another like metric that they are looking at right so what happens is uh, then because of suddenly everything went online so suddenly everybody was working many different time zones which means that they were expected to answer calls from all sorts of times and when they had all these different meetings across different time zones um and over here what we realized was that we were just being given like oh you know this is the time zone do it and nobody dared to say a thing. So it's about stepping up and saying something. Not saying, you know what, like I hate to work, but rather, you know, let's come up with something that's different, that's better. So for instance, let's say if part of your job description that you agreed upon is that you would have to be on call from this time to this time, then there has to be provision. I'm not saying that is the perfect thing to do, but you know, we're talking about different markets over time, right? So this is reality. So if that's part of what you have to do, then there have to be provisions for how you're going to recharge your batteries after that or before that. You know, maybe it's a different set of work hours that you have, but not expecting you to still show up at work the next day despite having your sleep cycle completely screwed. Yeah, it is surprising to me how many times I've ha I have to point out to people that boundaries are not a bad thing. I had this conversation very recently. I was visiting some relatives and had this conversation. I think maybe it's because of the work that I do. For me, it's the most setting boundaries is the most natural thing. But it is surprising, and for the benefit of my listeners, I would like to point this out that this is this is something that people still don't understand. Boundaries are your friends. They do not mean that there isn't enough love or respect in your relationship. It simply means that you, because you have respect for your job, for your boss, for your mother or father, brother, sister, 
That is why you have boundaries. It's the basic rule book on how this is going to operate. If you don't have rule books, then everything's going to be scattered. Okay, so I always think about boundaries, kind of uh, in 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 this way and why it's useful. Okay, so when I was a kid, I used to buy these packets of glitter and sequins from my school bookshop. Very very cute, very very pretty. Now glitter and sequins are cute and pretty. Only when they are contained. One day, I don't know what happened. They got spilled on the floor, and it became really ugly. It's really gross, and just you know, like you, one, you cannot appreciate it. Two, it becomes very dirty and very messy, and then it defeats the entire purpose. So you have to think about what a container is in order for something to work best in your in biology as well. You know, like your cells are being held together by membranes, right? And the organelles in your cell are also held together by membranes. Otherwise, they spill out, and all the bad things are going to happen. So think about it in this way: if we don't package it properly, then we can't make use of it. I love that analogy. Let's go and a little bit deeper into this topic. Let's talk about excellence versus perfection. Because that, I think, is another factor here. Yeah, it's actually one of my pet topics. I think that's so important. So obviously, you know, we find two camps of perfectionists. You know, we all know the people who go like, oh, you know, I'm a perfectionist. Therefore, you know, I haven't done this yet. Therefore, you know, like, for instance, they'll tell you about their fitness goals since like five years ago and actually things are getting worse. Um, or, you know, tell you about their work goals. And it's just a whole bunch of in my head bullshit, right? Then we got the perfectionists who are productive. They are actually getting things done. And yeah, sometimes their brain trips them up. But you know, maybe sometimes I think to myself, maybe some of them are not perfectionists, but rather they have been told by people that they have such high standards or they accomplish so much that they have to be a bad person because they're perfectionists. So one, let's like, get that clear, okay? You know, you can choose to have high standards. It doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make you an anxious person. It just means that you're committed to a certain level of excellence as long as you make sure that you're very, very clear on what you want. Because like I said, we have only a finite amount of energy. So you, if you open your phone every morning, the most it can have is 100% of energy, correct? So if you think about it that way, then you're not going to squander your own physical and mental energy. So knowing there are constraints, your boundaries, your cell walls, your cell membranes, okay, that helps you to decide what am I going to focus on? Because you can't be perfect in everything. Right. There are some things in your life that are just not worth being perfectionist about. Like making sure you have the best app for taking notes. Like seriously, do you really need 10 apps? <laughs> not quite, right. You know? Right. You don't, like, I was, you don't need another app to plan your time or your, or, your, or your whatever. You know, your notes works really well. Calendar works very well. Just get that sorted and you're done. You know, what matters is you actually put it in your notes and your calendar. If you don't put it there, you can have a thousand apps, spend a lot of money on it, and nothing's going to change. So, you know, let's get clear about not looking for the wrong solutions that are actually band-aids, okay? So that's where we decide how, you know, in which areas of our life do you want to be excellent in? And everything else doesn't need to be excellent, okay? So, you know, like, we have a lot of pressure because of scientific information and a lot of um, of, of, of like public health information and also a lot of peers doing um, that tells us about how we're supposed to live our lives, say, healthily, right? So let's say, i give you an example of 10,000 steps. So, you know, it's been shown that you don't need, one, you don't need 10,000 steps and two, the idea of 10,000 steps was used by the Japanese pedometer company because it sounds like a nice number, right? Now, obviously, you know, ideas get diluted, ideas get involved and then they, become, they take a world of their own. Sure, that's culture. Sure, that's just the way culture evolves, right? But if you tell me to take a thousand steps, 10,000 steps every day, I'm going to melt. It's going to be so overwhelming for my brain because I have other things to be excellent in. And then I still have to take 10,000 steps. Right. And in fact, I, yeah, in fact, I even share with you how I was like laughing. Um, Because at, at the end of the year, I was doing a, a little review of the number of like of, of how the distance I walk or run every day. Okay, at the end of last year, my distance, my average distance was 7.9 kilometers. And guess what? I still didn't hit 10,000 steps. And do you know how much time and effort it takes to hit 7.9 kilometers a day? A lot. So it's got to be how big your steps are as well. 
you know, it's things like that. So basically, you know, you have to ask yourself, like, you know, yes, you know, all the stuff I do, like, I need to eat this amount of vegetables every day. I need to eat this and that every day. But really, do you have time? Does your mental energy just get completely fried trying to be perfect in terms of checking all the boxes? So I tell my clients, you know what? Like, even if you just tell yourself, I'm going to walk 1,000 steps. I don't even look at steps. I look at distance, right? You just want to walk from A to B. That's great, right? Let's start with that. Um, and then you don't have to eat vegetables, like go out and hunt for vegetables every day if it's not normal for you. So maybe like on some days, like twice a week for my own rule is I'm going to pop vegetable powder into my yogurt because that is better than nothing rather than being perfect, having to hunt for vegetables, get resentful and don't eat vegetables. <laughs> okay. Which brings me to how, like, I'm going to introduce like this idea of excellence. So excellence is about the outputs the outcomes that you want okay get clear on that so get clear on what it looks like so no don't get like i want to be healthy what on earth does healthy look like how do you feel what what objective like um markers do you have inside you and outside you what are people saying you know like what's your mood how do you smell you know what what on earth does that look like and what do you look like now and what's the change that will help you contextualize what your output is going to be like so don't give something generic. The more generic, the less likely you're going to do it. Okay? And and then, then you know, like, also when it comes to output, you know, like, it's also got to do with the kind of person you are, the kind of things that you do. So, you know, I don't, like, I always tell people, I don't care what your motivation is, you know, like, even if it's politically incorrect. Yeah. So, for instance, at the end of lockdown 2020, I had put on a lot of weight. Not my finest, most glorious moment. To me, it was a lot of weight. It was very uncomfortable and I didn't feel happy in, in my body right so i went right you know what no more yo-yoing for the rest of my life so yo-yoing is like you know sliding between burnout and feeling good right so in the same sense you know, as I, it, it was my one moment where life humbled me and told myself you know what like this is my last yo-yo ever again okay so i decided okay you know i'm going to do the work put the hard work in learn to have discipline for the first time in my life which is difficult for somebody with ADHD totally admit that and do it and then obviously you know I've, it's been more than three years i've kept at it which means it's part of my identity even though sometimes i still doubt myself right but the thing about here is that you know when people ask me what was your reason for doing that most people would actually tell you i want to be healthy right and i i tell the truth i wanted to wear crop tops <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> Some people find it very funny and refreshing. And I said that, but yeah, you know, healthy might be one of the motivations there, but healthy is not going to light the fire under me to get me going. So choose that one motivation that gets you going. And once you are there, then your motivations might change. And that's great as well. So essentially what I'm saying that, you know, like you can have a mix of motivations and that's okay okay and then when it comes so that's a motivation bit which gets you between inputs and outputs right so in terms of your inputs okay so stop looking for the perfect inputs the perfect inputs don't exist or to do that will exhaust the crap out of you and make you incredibly energy inefficient okay so in an ideal world the perfect inputs you know like in like we all are taught it's like Oh, you need to walk 10,000 steps a day. You need to eat five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, right? Um, you need to eat a certain amount of protein every day. Eat like, you know, 20 supplements or something like that. Um, meditate for two hours a day. You shouldn't be touching your phone two hours before you sleep. Uh, you should be doing X, Y, Z. Yeah, yeah. Shoulda, woulda, coulda. And obviously, all the different experts and experts all debate that and laugh at each other and all that stuff right tear each other down i don't care again i don't care about that I, like what i care about then is be clever about your inputs one what is inputs that are important for you right now that align with a lifestyle okay? right because right. if your lifestyle is not aligned it's going to be very very hard you know a lot of times success is not about just your willpower it's about actually rigging your environment to your success and that's part of winning the mental game, right? It's how you shape your environment. So if my books are there in front of me, it's easier to open it. But if my books are under a stack, it's going to be harder for me because it takes me a few extra steps, right? Okay. 
it's easier for it's very easy for me to go to the gym now because it's just downstairs in my building. But if I had to travel to a gym, it might be harder. So being very clear about how all this, you know, like inputs that you choose are aligned with you. Okay, let's say you know you happen so so for like so um I live in the center of Singapore, this right smack in the city center, right? So because of that, I make the choice to walk a lot, which is why I hit seven point nine. Um, on average a day right and also i make the choice to take public transport even though people go like oh does it mean you have no money i'm like how's that going to do with money or not it's got to do with what i can do with my body because i sneak in a lot of stairs by taking the underground right? whenever i'm in london so i sneak in a lot of stairs whenever i'm taking the underground and so that helps me so think about inputs as one do they fit into your life or not Okay, if they don't, how can you rig them? So for instance, some clients come to me and, you know, this is not their main goal. Okay, but part of, you know, the secondary goals is that they need to hydrate their bodies better because they forget. So get a whole delivery of water bottles on autopilot, stack water bottles around your house and your office and drink. That's another way of inputs. So it's not about just measuring your water or buying the fanciest water bottle because that may not inspire you to drink, <laughs> but rather having that water right smack in front of your face, having the alarm telling you you got to do that can make a difference, right? And like, you know, again, like the whole, like no two hours of blue light um, before sleeping, like it's, it's great in the ideal world, but in a world where say some of my clients are working till really, really late because they're working across time zones, right? It's not going to work at all. So, you know, like, what can we do as a compromise? So, for instance, like, with my clients, you know, and there's, like, this alarm clock that we set before their bedtime, okay? So, there's two alarms. The first alarm, you know, like, it would be, two, like, let's say they're supposed to sleep at, at 12 a.m., 10, 10 midnight, right? So, the first alarm might be 11 p.m. That tells them, okay, set the power down. Second alarm might be 11.15 and then after that, you know, like normal so them, I just tell them, go and take care of your skin, go and shower, go and brush your teeth. And after, in, in that window of time, you don't touch your phone anymore. So you know, most people paralyze themselves by giving themselves or, or, or by accepting or resigning to the standards that everybody like preaches to them or prescribes to them. And then what happens is they never do it. They get paralyzed. So if so, you think about this, better than nothing inputs gives you excellent outputs but if you try to look for perfection in your inputs without thinking them through trying to pile everything your outcome is paralysis if people do this i think what i love one of the results that people will get that i love personally would be that they would be in constant communication with themselves the self-awareness would like really amplify because they'll be watching themselves and that would entail maybe making a very, very informed decisions, optimizing environment, body, food, everything to a degree where they'll be getting so much more out of the resources they have. Yeah. And, and also remember, like, you know, you don't have to optimize everything over and go, yeah, sure. And if you're doing something really intensive in a coaching or boot camp, then great. Just make sure that you have a system that stays on with you in your life, right? And you know how to review. So for instance, if you drink enough water every day, you account for coffee. So again, you know, perfection input says don't drink coffee, right? Don't drink wine. But if you're aware of say, you know, what's your last coffee according to your body type? Um, if you're aware of, like say you, for every cup of coffee you have, twice the amount of water or three times the amount of water, you know how to make up for that. So it's not about I need to drink how many liters of water a day. You know, again, you're not a camel. You might be drinking water in other ways, like by eating fresh fruit, by drinking a lot of soup. So, you know, being very clear about that instead of having very arbitrary guidelines and be aware that guidelines are not there for you to just shoot them down. They're not completely idiotic, but rather they're just guidelines. So everybody's bodies will react differently. And as your body and your physiology changes, again, it's going to change the in terms of what you're going to need from your life. So if you hydrate yourself enough, then your brain is going to work differently. Your brain is going to be sharper. And when your brain is sharper, you can start, and then this hydration becomes autopilot, then you can start adding an extra habit and training yourself, right? So, you know, if you're doing this alone, it's a lot easier to just start with one thing.
But then let's say, obviously, if you're doing something with in a like coaching program like what I do with my clients, you know, it's easier to do a few things. But then again, you know, we have to make sure that the steps are so simple. The system is so simple that the only thing standing between success and you is you. I love that. I love all of it. And here is something that I would like to add to that. You know, when we really want to do something, we'll find a reason to do it. So like I love coffee. I will find, but again, because of the work that I do, I'm more aware of these tendencies in myself. Maybe someone who doesn't do this work probably wouldn't be said for their sake. I want to say this. I have seen my clients find resources that validate what they believe, what they want to believe. So, you know, what you pointed out, that is perfect. You will find a reason to keep doing the things that you want to do, even if they are getting in the way of your progress. So don't... Of course get wrapped up in all all the many 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 output uh, many 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 sources of information that there are in the world someone will tell you drink coffee someone will tell you don't drink coffee it's terrible I'll just pick up a magazine every single after, uh, every single month it's going to tell a yeah. different thing about exactly everything. so what's better is what you are saying be very aware of your goals your values what you want out of life and where you want excellence where you want perfection where you want the results and where it's okay to, you know, maybe give cut yourself some slack, perhaps. Uh, it's okay. It, it's good to be human. It's okay to have one or two vices left. Like, you know, um, this is something that oh, I share very openly that, you know, I, I sleep late. Okay, one is because I like working across different time zones that actually works very well in my brain. And so my... Tr- so that's, that's something that I, I like and I'm very open about. And the fact is that on an average week, I sleep eight hours a day at least. Because I, I have ways of sleeping till later. And I have days when I naturally love to sleep a long time. And sometimes I have holidays where I just sleep. It's just because my own, so again, this is down to my, my own brain chemistry, my own brain awareness, is that um, there are some days where I have to just keep dreaming and dreaming and dreaming until the dreams completely f- finish. And then my body just knows, wake up. So I have designed my life in a way where I can do this so because of that i'm very open about the fact that you know sleeping late is my one vice that i have left and it's okay i'm allowed to have vices i don't want to be an irritating human being because my younger self will be very irritated by me now because she'll go like what you go you run (laughs) (laughs) i love that i love all the the examples that you're sharing they're they're so amazing you said you have adhd right yes so Tell me this because I've I have no knowledge of the subject. I I don't know nearly enough about ADHD to be commenting on any part of it. But uh, I did see some videos online that talked about how AD people who have ADHD for them it's impossible to manage time. It's they've come up with a term for it, time blindness. I think they're calling it. So is that true like for any listener who has ADHD, I would want them to have this information. Is it possible for you to really like the advice that you've given all of it can they can they do it or are there limitations that come with being an adhd that make certain things i know it's in it varies from individual yeah. to individual but yeah. i would still like just so- well i'm sitting in front of you i yeah. showed up for an interview i finished three advanced degrees so clearly i can manage my time <laughs> <laughs> love it love it <laughs> never missed a flight before you know like so clearly I can manage my time. So, you know, like this goes down to different ideas and preconceptions. Like, so the thing about being neurodiverse and you know, ADHD, dyslexic, autistic, or ADD, which doesn't have the H, the hyperactive um, component, uh, dyspraxic, is that essentially your brain is wired in a way that is significantly different from people who are neurotypical. And there's no good or bad here. It's just reality it's just like my reality is i was born in the body of a woman right and someone else might be born in the body of a man and then my cat's born in the body of a cat you know this is reality that we are we find ourselves this is like reality giving us boundaries put it that way right um well think about this way and so but the problem with neurodiversity is that you know like while you're very good at some things your day-to-day life can make you feel like you're walking and there are these demons on the floor trying to grab your feet and you're tripping. So because you are tripping up in day-to-day life stuff like time blindness, which is basically forgetting or not being not aware of time, you know, like if someone tells you let's meet at 4.15, your brain may not be able to see 15 or 45 and change the numbers. It happens a lot. 
yeah um so you know like so being very aware of that one and learning not to feel so helpless about that is one big step otherwise you will never be able to shine with your strengths because you're trying to function as an adult os so it's almost like you know let's say my brain my brain loves macs right <laughs> Macbooks, books um app by apple os and i'm trying to work in a completely different os system it's going to waste a lot of energy so be very aware of how you are functioning how you're wired but again, you know, don't use that as an excuse. You know, like for instance, a long time ago, I read this article that says your introversion is not an excuse to be an asshole. I love that. I'm an introvert myself, but you know, <laughs> like I see enough people telling me, giving me that, that whole bullshit about how, oh, you know, I'm an introvert, I'm an empath, therefore I'm like that. I'm like, nope, it's, that's just you being completely horrible, different, completely different. Okay. So when it comes to ADHD or ADD or any kind of neurodiversity, yes, it can be hard. So ask yourself, what are the main things you need to keep your life in order? Okay, one is not a thousand different apps. Your brain cannot take that overwhelm. Two is what can I practice to keep my life in order? So for instance, I have a lot of very nice handbags. And what I found is really easy is I have the same handbag that I bring everywhere. <laughs> so my best friend, um, he's, he's, he's a very flamboyant gay man. So he goes, I met him a few years ago only. And he goes, babe, you're an enigma, you know? I'm like, what do you mean by that? And he goes, everywhere you go, you carry the same bag. I'm like, it's just easy for my brain. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. of course, I can carry the other bags, which I do on holidays. So every holiday, I'll just bring two extra bags, two different bags. And they become that one, like, bagged up, right? Um, but you know what? Like, if I don't have to exhaust my brain, great. Just, like, this bag, this Miu Miu handbag that's about this size. And somehow, it fits a lot of things so you know from some basic skincare which to me is important um it's got my small water bottle it's got a notebook it's got you know like um and and it's got like you know maybe like tissue paper and just a few other things and you know like it can fit even more extra stuff like including shopping or whatever but so everything's in that bag and i bring that bag to barry's where i walk out <laughs> because it's easy right right i don't care if it's a leather bag who cares? No one's judge. Oh, uh, even they judge. I don't care. <laughs> okay, I bring that back to hike, and when I hike, we're actually hiking eighty stories worth. But somehow it works for me, so I don't care. Because if I had to keep changing my bag, yes, I can tolerate it. But no, I do not want to waste that energy because I'll be forgetting how to transfer my stuff, and I'm going to be losing things. And I really don't need my life to look like that. That's one. And so, you know, when it comes to neurodiversity, especially when it comes to ADHD, you will forget things. A lot of, we call that the ADD, ADHD tax, where when you are withdrawing money from the bank machine, you lose, you forget. A lot of people with ADHD get very excited about credit card deals. So, you know, my, one of my best friends will be telling me, another best friend, I know, <laughs> will be telling me, hey, babe, you know, there's this credit card and then you get like $50 off, da, 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 da. and I'm like, you know what? enough yes there are some savings there are some perks but you know what like i need my live streamline because my brain can handle it but no i do not want to put myself through that my sanity is so much more important so i streamline and i choose the cards that i actually like and that i want to work with and that basically is how you think right so my personal values and um, in terms of how i want to organize my life are based on two principles. One, my life needs to be as lean as possible. Yeah, I know. Sure, you see a lot of books behind me, but even then, they're all cowed and streamlined. I just happen to like to read, okay? So it needs to be lean. That's one. So I get rid of all the things that I don't need or I don't want or I don't like. Or if I do like some things, like I like my clothes, I make sure that it's very organized so that my brain doesn't short circuit. okay? Then two, I like my life to be agile so I can just move and leap anytime. So ask yourself, like, if you're neurodiverse, how do you want to spend your life? You know, like, if you don't really need to leap a lot, okay, maybe you don't need to be so agile. But, you know, one really good important thing would be keep it lean. So you don't need a thousand things overwhelming you because back to the whole ADHD thing, a lot of them get excited by credit cards and all the deals because it appeals to this novelty sense. So a lot of normal things do not switch on the ADHD brain, which is why we find it very hard to do mundane stuff. Okay? And then novelty makes us impulsive. It makes us happy, makes us excited. So when your brain switches on and goes, yay, let's do that, right? 
But then the number of people with ADHD, ADD, who forget to pay their credit card bills are a lot. So essentially, what the thing here is stop creating more messes to clean up. Yes, you can clean your mess. Like, I have no doubt that everybody will learn how to cope and tolerate, but really, do you really need to suffer so much? That's my question. Right. I love this. I love this because this is, yes, I uh, have compassion for people who, you know, who have these not limitations because the way you've answered that question it completely you know it, it is not a limitation it's just your your brain is working a little differently from everyone else and i love what you've shared because i think the online space the content we see online it's so quick to give people excuses uh to not really step up their game to continue to so self-indulge so i love what you've shared I myself have a neurosensitivity, light, sound, smells. They, they, yeah, they massively trigger my anxiety. I'm someone who lives with an anxiety in my, when, whenever my anxiety gets out of control, I have tremors, I have nosebleeds. I, uh, if it gets really bad, I also have visual audio hallucination. So I know wow. the stakes, what the stakes are for me. So I have to really simplify my life. I don't have many friends. I can't keep track of them. I can't nurture too many relationships. So I have like three and four relationships that I give all of myself to. And then everyone else just knows how I work. So they accept it if they want to be a part of my life, which is, I don't know, I'm so fine tuning that because that seems kind of mean, but, <laughs> but it's the best I can do. Because this is what, you know, like, this is the body you were born into. So, yes, you could suffer through and have a lot of, of, of difficulties, tremors, and all that stuff. But really, you know, like, is that really the price you want to pay? Yeah, but I would say this, though. In a few years back, orange lights would trigger a massive anxiety attack. Like, staying for more than 10 minutes under orange lights would, they would trigger a massive massive anxiety attack but now i can be in a room full of orange light like not full of orange lights but like i can be around orange lights it, it's fine i'm not very happy not very comfortable and i talk a lot less i notice um but i'm okay i don't panic i don't have an anxiety attack so i feel like your body will cooperate with you if you give it newer challenges with a lot of faith i don't know if that yeah makes sense but i i have noticed that in neuroscience we call it habituation so you know like yes your body naturally does not like orange light it, it also could the another element is the meta element where this fear of what's going to happen to you because you had it before is what amplifies everything else so when you take that fear away you are uncomfortable yes your body could function better but you're not going to melt up. I think that's 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 a new one. So like for instance, you know, like um, I used to have panic attacks a long time ago when I was in a bad situation in my life. And you know what I tell people, you know, when I coach my clients who have panic attacks, is that you know don't be a hero. Don't walk into a train, a hot train on a hot summer's day without water. There's nothing to like, you know. So sometimes in psychology we call them um safety behaviors. And you know what it said that safety behaviors stop us from from um stop us from from you know like like um attacking our anxiety but actually you know sometimes you have to be realistic if it's a hot day you're going to need water don't be crazy don't dehydrate yourself full stop right so like for me when i had panic attacks my first symptom would be heat running down the back of my neck and it's very uncomfortable for me but it's nothing to do with just panic attacks ex exclusively i have always always hated feeling hot and stuffy because as a child, I, I still get fevers quite a bit. But as a child, I had so many bad fevers. that. Um, and in Chinese medicine, what you do is you swaddle a child up in blankets to force their bodies to sweat. But that was so scary for me. And my body always remembers that. So I never, ever like the feeling of being like constrained and it's stuffy. And I don't want to be... So like right now, like many, many years later since, you know, like my last panic attack, I don't never want to be a hero and tell you that I'm going to swaddle myself up. There's nothing to prove. So, you know, again, this is the inputs output thing. So there's nothing to prove in terms of being brave or insane. That, that will be insane to me. But rather, you know, being able to honor the fact that there are things that our bodies don't like. So if your body doesn't like a certain kind of food, don't be a hero. You can choose your suffering in life. Yeah, sometimes we make it worse by, I don't know, proving to 
ourselves or somebody else something that actually doesn't matter. Yeah, I love that. And it's so true. Yeah, the same same applies to my life as well. I think it's true for everyone. Some like life is some amount of pain will always or not pain, but challenges will always be present. You will always have to push yourself to do certain things or to do them a certain way. That's just how life functions. Anybody who's yeah. looking to escape that, bypass that, have like an easy ride. I I don't <laughs> think you're gonna get much done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, or maybe you don't need much done. You know, some people have different, you know, they have different ideas and expectations of life, and that's okay, you know. Um, but then like you have to learn to live in reality. So you know, if any solution teaches you to escape from reality, then I would strongly like encourage you to think are you sure that's right for you you know because the longer the time you don't live in the real world the harder it is to get back to it because it gets scary i mean i think let's say you know you spend a few uh, let's say you spend like two weeks or three weeks not talking to a friend or your partner because you're upset with each other and then you tell yourself next week next week right when it becomes week four it gets even harder because momentum has built in the other direction. Your fear pathways, your anticipation of bad things happening is going to grow even bigger in your brain. So do your best. Don't con- disconnect yourself from the real world. And if, let's say, you know, you're going to a retreat and all that stuff, yeah, sure. But then always ask yourself that this question that I say and I call the and then what question. And then what's going to happen after I go to this retreat? So, you know, like sometimes we put too much stock in some magical solution, you know, like, oh, this three letter thing or this retreat is going to save me. But, you know, let's just like I always say, you know, let's just be very, very clear about this. If I go to a retreat in a remote island where I'm being given soup and fresh fruit every day and there's a lot of nature and I'm not allowed to work, then I might actually end up feeling better. Maybe I'll feel worse for a bit, but I'll end up feeling better. And then you know, I may lose weight, I may feel healthier, blah, 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 blah. But then what happens when I go back to real life? What is the yeah. solution there? And you know, it's not the same as somebody giving a piece of paper and saying that, oh, you know how to do it now and you remember to do it. Like, am I actually motivated to create that? Do I have a structure um, that, you know, let's say, let's say I'm really busy and I don't know how to cook and cooking exhausts me, okay? This is a completely fictitious example, okay? Um, and so so in this sense, if I have clients like that, like what I'll do is I'll say, can you make sure the food comes to you? Can you actually order like this thing on rotation? You know, let's make it easy. Make sure that the water comes to you. I mean, like, you know, like just because someone prescribed something as self-care or good for your well-being doesn't mean it's necessarily good for your well-being. Okay, so you know, like, so here we're talking about taking breaks and all that stuff. You know, it's not necessarily just about slowing down because maybe you're the kind of person who doesn't like slowing down yet. Again, like, you know, I will say never say never, but there's some people who just move a lot faster than other people. And again, no value judgment, no right, no best, no wrong. But rather, you know, it's just that know yourself and know that you might be able, you might change. But for now, know who you are right now, <laughs> okay? And so when it comes to recovery, if you think about sports, psychology, and how to recover, okay? So let's say, think about it this way, right? Like um, muscles are broken in the gym, right? They are fed during your meals and they grow during recovery. Okay. Okay, so you never give yourself rest time nothing is ever going to grow. You're just going to get exhausted. You're going to injure yourself. And then that's called a forced recovery. So the only way to become elite, and I'm talking about like, you know, like super, like pro, like Olympian kind of elite, right? Is actually to rest, to learn how to recover. And some of my clients, you know, being more like fast-paced brain, ADHD, ADD type, um, you know, what they will say is that, I don't want to get, I, there's only so much Netflix and coziness I can do. I'm like, no, nope, we're not talking about Netflix and Cozy. We're not talking about Instagram's like prescriptions of you know like unicorn lattes and bubble baths. I love unicorn lattes. I love bubble. Okay, maybe I don't know anymore, but I used to <laughs> when I was younger. Okay, I do love bubble baths. Okay, so I know they work for me, and I know the intention I set when I take my bubble baths. Right, so it's meant to help me. I set intention even before a facial. Right, so that helps me and supports me in that way. But if you're not aware of whether this thing serves you, or you're not putting yourself in the 
space, then it's not going to serve you. You're actually going to feel worse. And wellness is going to clog up your to-do list. Mm, right. That makes so much sense. Is this where owning your story comes in? Owning your story, um, yes. In terms of owning who you are and what got you here today. That's very important because like a lot of times we try to you know, play nice and be nice. And, you know, there's something that I reflect on with my friends that, you know, I think that the one thing that got me into trouble was when I was younger was actually like trying to be normal and trying to be nice. I had no boundaries. Obviously, I didn't learn boundaries, but I didn't feel I had permission to have boundaries. I always thought you could love bad people's bad, bad, like, um, bad behavior away. You could just be tolerant and trying to be normal. Taught, um, made me a bit more impulsive because I put myself in the position of this is how somebody normal would act and that really screwed me up really really badly okay um so like so so you know like this is one like owning like, understanding who you are and being able to articulate that so you know maybe you don't like it, it comes to you like your day-to-day life stuff you know like I, I have some women clients who find it a struggle even to say like I don't like to eat steak. So they'll go to steak, a steak restaurant with somebody because they're afraid to say that they don't like it. Because they're not taking themselves from that, you know. So, you know, it comes to, down to articulating that in your day-to-day choices. Like for instance, I don't like to eat this, I don't like to drink this. Can we do something different? And find that happy common ground that both of you like. Or let's say, you know, like it comes to like your social attention spend. Yeah, you could tolerate sitting down for six hours in a long party, right? But maybe your social attention span is a lot shorter. So instead of six hours, you can make it two hours or, you know, go for one hour, have fun, and then leave. Because you are still showing up. You're still putting in the work. You're still putting in your social credits. And also think along these lines on how you can make yourself happy and make the other person happy. Yeah. This is super helpful because I think a lot of people, as they are working with a coach or a therapist, what they're doing sometimes is they are trying to change themselves on, you know, the, the like pieces of their personality, their interpersonal interactions, but they're also trying to optimize their life. And I, I don't know about you, maybe you'll disagree with me, but I don't think the two process complement each other all that much because I remember doing, doing this myself trying to be a person who is very social and very always up, always energetic. It's not who I am, but I was trying that as I was recovering from depression and learning to like create systems within the day so I can manage my anxiety and also be productive. The two did not go together, had a massive setback and really had to go back to the drawing board and, and really t- take a lot of time for recovery again. So uh, I I don't know if I'm making sense, but Instead of owning your story makes, I think that's awesome. Like there, obviously if you're doing something really, really bad, if you're hurting people, then obviously you need to. (laughs) If you're hurting yourself and and you're hurting somebody else, how I normally use that as a metric would be, are you creating more messes to clean up? If you are, then don't do it, right? But then like, you know, there's some things that it's based on how, so basically optimization is based on how you're wired. And the person that you are today, right? So you have to think along those lines rather than hope for an alien to possess you and become somebody else. And also, like, you know, when it comes to optimization and all these different things about inputs, you know, I think what's really important is to be able to experiment, you know, not just think that, okay, this person, this CEO has got this perfect routine. I'm just going to steal it. No, it's not going to work. So be willing to experiment, be willing to play with it for some amount of time, then review. So you know, you're not second guessing yourself as you play with it. Be willing to fail. So, you know, like just because you failed in a tactic doesn't mean you failed in your outcome. Sometimes we get too wedded to, oh, you know, like everybody does this. So if I don't do this, there's something wrong with me. Or if I couldn't persist with this, there's something wrong with me. Nope. You know, like learning how to fail fast and exit fast when it doesn't work is so important. Yeah. Thank you for saying that because that is, I think that happens a lot in this, you know, we pick routines from other people and then we just run with it and it does not work. No, no, it doesn't work at all. I mean, like, um, so I love following Alex Homozy, who's an awesome entrepreneur and um, I love his tough love advice, you know, but yes, it's tough, but it's also love, right? And 
one thing that you know that that he talks about that I love is that you know all these perfect routines from the CEO or this great person, it probably didn't bring them to success. They probably created these routines after they got success. Ah, right, 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 right. Yeah, because so many times you hear a routine. And they have like yeah. these uh, very sectioned, they've really sectioned their day. And to someone yeah. starting a business, like I used to listen to their advice and I would be like, there's no way I can do this. I have just started a business. I've got a million things to do in a day. And yep. sometimes I have to put out fires and some priority has to, there's no way I can section. These people have like teams. They have resources <laughs> yeah. that they can. Yeah, that's just such an important like um distinction to make, and like you know, are your routines serving you? So you know, if you're doing your routines and you're tired, and you know, like what I call it, clogging up a to do list, then maybe they don't serve you at all. You know, like so, like for instance, um, if you're walking say twenty thousand steps a day because you're trying to be perfect, right, and doubling it, and then and if it's making you exhausted, you have no time to do other things, then maybe it's not the best thing for you to do. So, you know, be willing to experiment and be willing to be self-aware and be willing to tell people that, you know what, thanks, but no thanks. Or, you know, like, um, I'm not looking for advice. I'm not looking for suggestions. I'm actually okay. Because they're, in certain cultures, people are incredibly nosy and irritating. And sometimes, you know, maybe some of them, like, you wouldn't take it from a bad place. As in, you don't think they're putting it from a bad place. But some people are. And that can throw you off your game. So it's very important to be able to go well, like, you know what, I'm not interested in this. Or, you know, not advice at all. Or, you know, like a simple boundary thing would be, okay, I can tell you and I'm not looking for any advice or comments. Then the set the stage. Otherwise, you know, like you get a lot of unnecessary headache that you don't need to have because everybody has an idea. You know, like last night I was just musing on, on my stories about this, you know, body positivity versus body neutrality, body shaming thing. And, you know, for every shape and weight that you are, you'll be too fat and too thin for everybody else. <laughs> you never please anyone. And, you know, it's not about it. So, 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 like, so, you know, when it comes to different parts of your life, different parts of your health, your fitness, your performance, your finances your resources your relationships you know like you don't have to celebrate everything and pretend everything's awesome even when they're not like so like body positivity you know like if you don't like your wobbles you don't like your pimples don't celebrate them right yeah i mean it's simple as that, right yes. and you know like and then neutrality what it means is you know this is what it looks like now and i'm allowed to still like myself or still respect myself enough and not like it or like it so if you don't care about how about your body or your finances or whatever you're allowed not to care about it there's a sense of like acceptance of this is the way things are and these are the things that i'm actually interested in as the person i am now today or as the person i would like to turn into I love that. Talk to me about healing old patterns because I, we talked about owning our story. But then there yep. are parts of that story that no longer apply, but we keep carrying their weight simply because we've internalized certain labels, we've internalized certain ideas. Is there a way to work through that? Of course, there's a way to work through that. And basically, the most important thing is that, you know, like, stop thinking everything's going to do with a mindset or mantra. If you're not feeling good, if you feel like an imposter, which is a really big mindset issue that a lot of perfectionists, type A people, like, demand influence do, then don't lie to yourself that you're brave or you're brave when you're scared. So, you know, like, like the same thing I do, I talk about the battery, acknowledge what your battery num number is. There's, there's no shame in stating an objective fact like it's raining that's a fact there's a row of dustbins that's a fact there's a really handsome man there that's a fact there's a very cute dog that's all a fact so be able to do that instead of lie to yourself because when you lie to yourself your brain and body erupt for vengeance okay so there comes a point where you know like winning the mental game is not just about a mantra especially when your body is not in the receptive state to receive a mantra. So then, you know, when you're thinking about what holds us back, what are all these old patterns, a lot of them have got to do with, you know, things that our body has stored. So, you know, our body stores trauma. Trauma doesn't always just happen from being, um, like, in a near-death experience or watching someone die or watching someone suffer. 
trauma t- traumatic symptoms we call them small t events small t events can also small t symptoms can also happen from even things that are supposed to make us happy okay like for instance you were promoted in your job but then you turn it turned out job to be a bad fit for you or you know like or you had a new boss after you got promoted you emigrated you're supposed to have a great life, but then something bad happened, right? Or something, even something good happened. You know, some some people like they have kids. Their kids are great, but then they realize they don't like kids, and then they fight with themselves of all that. Um, so you know, a lot of things that can seem to bring you joy that you think I should be happy can actually be traumatic symptoms. So trauma is not something you can talk away or lie to yourself about. Trauma is not in your body, and there are many ways of working with your body. That you know, we got we're talking about neuroscience, talking about therapeutic methods. Um, to help a person to process that trauma and move forward and also integrate that story in your brain, okay? Because a traumatic memory is stored in your amygdala, your fear center, and it's not contained well. So it's like, you know, it's like no matter how you push the cupboard close, everything keeps spilling out. So when you process memory, what happens and you process what's going on in your body, what's stored in your body? Then what happens is this memory starts to transfer into your hippocampus, which is it's responsible for your longer term memory, and it's nicely organized. Like you know, it's a gorgeous filing cabinet. If you like neatness, you understand what that means, right? You appreciate what that is. So you know, if you can think about that in that way, that's going to help you. And um, when we're talking about, say, you know, the things that we need to own, the limiting patterns that we have, you know, it's not about just working about them when things are bad. So you know, for instance, you know, people will look for therapy services or coaching services when they are super anxious, when they're super panicky, and then the moment if you okay, we're not even saying good, yeah, okay, meaning that it's bearable, they disappear. So this is a really, really bad state to be because even when you are okay, which is a very low bar. Um, you're basically tolerating a lot of that stuff. So it's really what you put in every single day, not, you know, like when only when you're feeling bad, you know, like this has to be part of your discipline. So it's like if you burn out and then you go to a retreat and you feel better, you're one of the lucky people who feel better, then you come back into your real life and then you burn out again, you feel even more helpless. That's a bad place to be because you cannot be arrogant enough to think that you know like if you keep your old habits <laughs> and your old lifestyle and your old mindsets things are magically going to change you nope know, that's delusion or gen z we call it delulu right <laughs> so don't be delulu about you know like about like how to sustain a good habit so it's about committing to it in a way that suits you right now so you know like when you're starting a habit you know, like, so when setting habit, one, you know, like obviously you have to figure out what you want out of it, the system and structure to get you there. And then you also have to figure out other things like what stops you. What are your biggest obstacles that stop you in your environment, in your head, and even the people around you, right? Because our, our, the people are very important in terms of the messages that they give us. So, you know, figure that out. And then when you start a new habit, it's also about removing an old habit which could be a mindset, right? And committing to this pattern. When you start it, it's a lot more intense, which is why people go for boot camps, right? But then remember that once you get the system going and once you start getting results, you don't have to be as intense anymore. And yes, it's going to be terrifying as you take your foot off the accelerator. The thing is that as long as you keep committing to it, that's going to be the most important is what you do in your day-to-day life that matters, which means that you cannot afford to pile your day-to-day life with a lot of perfect rules because that's never going to happen. So I'll give you an analogy that I know that I always teach my, all my clients. So I have a doctor that takes care of my skin, so she lasers my skin, right? And so you know, she, so she tells me about the different lasers. And then like some of them are so intense and so and obviously very expensive. And I ask her, like, why? And she tells me that, oh, you know, it's because it's, it's, it's designed to undo the bad things we do in our day-to-day life. So you do it. Then between sessions, you can go and mess up as much as you want. You can neglect yourself, whatever. Then you just think to yourself, okay, I'll go there. I'll reverse it, right? But the thing is that if you keep just keep reversing, you're never going to become, like, that awesome, beautiful person you want to be, right? Because you're... because. You know, you're just like, let's say, you know, let's say this is your baseline and then you 
damage yourself, you go then you go this way, and then you reverse it, you become here or here. You know, what we really want is to keep improving. No, I'm not saying, you know, like make your face perfect. What I'm saying is you know, maybe you want to feel more stronger, have stronger, more vitality, you know, have healthier skin. You know, those might be the different benchmarks. Um, so the only way you can not just keep going back and forth from here to here or even feel so helpless you go all the way back is that what matters then the secret is basically how you live your day-to-day life so imagine like you know you're you're here and then you come here every day you just keep moving and moving and you know not every day needs to be super intense you know some days could just be a bit more work some days could be less work but the whole, whole point is you're not doing things to create more yeah this is helpful uh, i was gonna ask you about uh being decisive during chaotic periods of our life because chaos is so much a reality of everyone's life but i think what advice you've shared up to this point will take care of you during those periods when the chaos amplifies but anything you want to add to what we have discussed up to this point so obviously, you know, like face up the fact that you're human, that's one thing. <laughs> and and the second one is what I call like, you know, like have a certain like um protocol in your life for who you are right now in terms of what you need to keep your life intact. So for instance, I always take care of my skin because that's important to me. And that also helps me to relax as well. And it's also like for me, like I know why I'm doing it because I feel competent and I feel like no matter how messy, like, you know, like or, or, or tiring a life period can get, I have something to prove to myself that I did the work. Okay, so be aware of that. Okay, so thinking of my skin is very important. Making sure that I walk every day. It's, it's great. I know it's great for my brain. Okay, making sure that I eat a few healthy meals a week. I'm not even saying every day, yeah? So I commit to only like two healthy dinners a week. And then making sure that I deep breath. So I do like three deep breaths in between things. And making sure that, you know, like, I have a certain number of what I call my social vitamins. So they're my relationship vitamins. So, you know, if I'm with this person, that person, you know, like I, because as an introvert, it's easy for me to isolate and, you know, decide that I'm not going to talk to people sometimes, sometimes. Okay. So I make sure that I, I know my dosage of social vitamins. I don't overdose. Okay. This is really, really basic stuff. Like making sure that I know what nourishes my brain and my body. I pray as well. So praying helps me to ground myself and connects me beyond myself. So, you know, think about what are your very basic level or non-negotiables in your life and commit to them every day. Because you'd be surprised that you know, some people, when it's their chaos, they self-sabotage, they punish themselves. You know, like they don't brush their teeth. They don't take care of the skin. They drink and eat too much and they don't even like what they're drinking. That's the worst thing, you know, like, so, you know, so, so for instance, for one of my clients, I'm like, dude, do you even like McDonald's? He goes, actually, I, I fucking hate it. So he's doing it to punish himself. I say, dude, I eat McDonald's like twice a month because I actually love it. Okay? But if you don't like it at all, don't touch it. So stop. You know? So um, so think about your basic level of non-negotiables that keeps you safe. That's, that's, all, that's all you do during this period of time because when things are hard, the hard work is not the same as striving, working hard at work, you know, achieving, creating new stuff, winning awards or what accolades or whatever it is. The hard work when things are hard is basically one, show up. Even if you don't want to show up, you show up. Yeah. So let's say, you know, you wake up on a day when you've been depressed, right? You completely numb, apathetic, and your brain tells you, I don't know what to do. There's nothing to do. Okay. What can I do today is a Sunday. There's nothing. Your brain just goes into this numbness. It's like bleak hollowness, right? And so you you have to make sure that even if your brain is telling you all this stuff, just don't walk. Just lay in bed. If you're really, really ill, okay, different, okay? But but if not, so, so you know, like, yes, you can wake up feeling like shit, like pure, unadulterated shit, okay? But you're going to make sure that you're not going to end that day feeling like shit. Because if you end that day feeling like shit, one bad day becomes 10. And 10 bad days become 100 very quickly. Okay? So your job during hard times or chaotic times is to make sure that you show up and the day is not over. Even if you sleep in till 9 p.m. to punish yourself, there's still three more hours. Even you sleep till 9 p.m. and decide to go sleep, go back to bed at 1 a.m., there's four hours in between that you can do something to help yourself. 
so that you reclaim that day. Okay, and I know it can feel like Groundhog Day because you're like, oh God, every day I have to put in the effort just for the day not to suck. Yes, that will be a reality. But as your newer pathways for helping yourself get stronger and you feel more connected with yourself and with the world because you're having your social vitamins, you're having your own vitamins in your brain and your body, you're eating differently, you're you know, like, you're drinking water, you know, you're walking, because walking, it's, it's amazing for your brain. And basically, you're going to get better. you got to keep the faith because you're not a, some special snowflake where if you do all the stuff, nothing's going to change. Something will help you. That is my kind of advice. <laughs> I love it. Lastly, before we sign off, I want you to let people know if they want to work with you because I think this is awesome advice, but some of us might need a little bit of help executing it. So if somebody wants to work with you, what can they do? So I work in eight-week programs, okay, to maximize your success and also in order to help you stay accountable. That's so important. And uh, eight weeks so that you don't talk to me forever. You don't have to see me forever. <laughs> we don't have to be talking about the same nonsense over and over again without any change. Okay, so how they can do this, they can go to my website, um, perpetuaneo.com slash connect and then sign up for a chemistry call. Or, you know, if there's no time that, that, that works in that schedule for that week because the schedule is only released for like every four days just pop me an email and say hey you know this is what's going on and reach out you know just because on a day you feel okay but not good doesn't mean that you can just ignore yourself because remember it's what you do in your okay days in your great days that helps you get through your life so we've reached the end of this video thank you so much for watching and for sharing your time with me the video description will have the link to all the resources mentioned during the conversation and if you would rather listen to these episodes then you can find experimental podcast on most podcast platforms if you enjoyed the video please do share your thoughts in the comment section and if you want to watch more subscribe to the channel please and do hit the notification bell i will see you again in the next video until then please do take care of yourself bye